Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Guccio. Today is a bonus episode. Uh, we're interviewing David Vorick once again. He was on the podcast a couple of months ago to talk about Saya. Well, they recently launched Skynet, which is a new product that builds on top of Saya and that adds a lot of functionality to their existing decentralized data storage network. And so we wanted to talk to David about that and understand what is Skynet and how it improves on Saya. But also I wanted to talk to David about something that we didn't get to discuss during our, our last uh, interview with him, which is trusted setups. So actually, I heard David speak for the first time in Tel Aviv at the Starkware Sessions conference, and he gave a talk about trusted setups, which I thought was really interesting. But we spent so much time talking about Saya in our last interview that we didn't get to cover this at all. So this was also an opportunity to sit down with him and, and talk to him about trusted setups, why he thinks they're broken, and what kind of approach we should have in terms of ensuring that zero knowledge setups and the zero knowledge infrastructure upon which presumably crypto will rely on in the future can be trusted. So there's lots of interesting ideas in this one and I hope you'll enjoy it. A little bit of housekeeping before the interview. We're going to do a virtual meetup on May 29th. You know, it's been several months now that all of us have been in confinement and we want to check up on how you guys are doing and you know, see what you're up to these days and uh, get the pulse for the types of things that you're interested in and just, yeah, have a chat. Um, so all of us will be there, Meher, Sunny, Brian, Frederica, and myself, and you can come hang out with us in a Zoom call. So it'll be on May 29th at 9 p.m. Central European time, 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And you can register for that at epicenter.rocks slash virtual meetup. And you'll get all the details and the calendar invite. So come and hang out with us. It'll be lots of fun. And with that, here's our conversation with David Vorick. We're here with David Vorick. David, thanks for joining us again on the podcast. Hey, great to be here. So we had you on just recently. I can't, I can't exactly remember how long ago, but it was like two or three months ago. And we we talked about Saya and everything that you guys were building there in terms of decentralized file storage. Uh, since then, there's been some news recently. You launched this this new layer on top of Saya or this new platform. We'll get into it in, in a moment uh, called Skynet. It's something that I'm personally really excited about because I'm I'm kind of like, excited about the opportunity to store files online in a decentralized way, in a trustless way that doesn't rely on companies like Dropbox and Google, et cetera. So I think it's something that even like I'll start using personally. So I'm really excited about that. And um, we also wanted to get you on because last time we didn't really get the time to talk about it. But you know, I first encountered you when you gave a talk at Starcore Sessions in uh, Tel Aviv, where you we were talking about trusted setups and how trusted setups are broken. And this is something that I've been wanting to talk to you about since we did that interview. And so uh, you know, we'll spend some time today talking about trusted setups and uh, how trusted setups are improving uh, with things like Sonics and stuff like that. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, glad to be here and uh, excited to talk about both Skynet and uh, explore trusted setups more deeply. So let's, let's maybe start with Skynet. So what is Skynet? You know, for, for those who heard the episode last time, or maybe some, some of those who didn't, let's, let's maybe just briefly recap on Saya and from there uh, get into Skynet and how it improves on, uh, on the existing Saya infrastructure. Yeah, so Skynet is an application development platform. And the ultimate goal of Skynet is to replace the cloud as the primary way that people deploy applications. Um, and so, for example, today, like half the internet is built on top of Amazon S3. When they go down, half the internet goes down. And there are very good reasons. The cloud offers many substantial advantages over a more decentralized, like host your own infrastructure approach. But this comes with a bunch of trade-offs. One of the key ones being Amazon's in control and everyone's kind of dependent on the single point of failure. And Skynet has been created as an answer to that. And so what we want to do is enable developers to build the next YouTube, the next Instagram, the next Snapchat, uh, and really with an emphasis on like social media um, or the next file sharing app, the next, you know, the next BitTorrent. 
on top of Skynet. And so Skynet is this application layer that gives you the ability to store and retrieve data. Um, and that data can be application code, it can be user accounts, it can be friends lists. And from that, you can build an entire rich decentralized application ecosystem. Um, and so that's what we're really excited about. We think it's, it's the most powerful thing that's ever come out uh, of the SIA team. So when we, when we talked about SIA last time, you, you described it as a, a, you know, a, a distributed uh, or decentralized file storage network where people are providing storage space, storage capacity. They're effectively renting it to the network and you know, other users can, can rent that storage space for a fee. They, they can store files there to retrieve those files. What does Skynet bring to that? What, what are the, what, what's new about Skynet that you know, we didn't have in the plain kind of SIA uh, infrastructure? And is it, is it built on top of SIA or is it totally different? So it's built on top of SIA. And really, it's not even like a layer two so much as it is, from, from a tech perspective, a small upgrade. What Skynet does is it allows people to download other people's files. And so before Skynet on SIA, if you uploaded something to SIA, you actually couldn't share it. The only person that could download it is you. And that, you know, it's good, it's good infrastructure and it's great for certain use cases, but it's very limiting if you're talking about the future of the internet. What Skynet does is it allows you to go and download any file that, that you have the encryption keys to and that you have the link to. And so you can share files with other people um, and then download them. So technologically, it's very, fairly simple. But what this allows you to do is build really rich, complex applications on top that essentially, you know, at the end of the day, most of the internet is just passing data around. And so now that Skynet has the ability or SIA has the ability to pass data around between users, we can build essentially the, the rest of the internet. So just to maybe put this in context of like comparing it to another project that, you know, many people might also be familiar with, which is IPFS. So, you know, I think you could say that the IPFS or the, the entire protocol labs stack had a similar goal, but you guys sort of approached it from different starting points where the Protocol Labs team built IPFS first, which is the CDN, the content delivery network. And they're in this like, you know, I don't know, five year long. So I don't know how long it's been so far, but you know, Filecoin is supposed to be this like sort of economic incentivization layer. Meanwhile, what you guys did was you sort of built the economic incentivization layer first, which was what SIA blockchain was. And then now you've built on the CDN system where like you have the content addressing and, you know, basically a network where do you guys use like similar sort of like DHT that IPFS uses, or do you use sort of a different technology underlying? Yeah. So the technology, um, and, and I love the way that you, that you put that. I think I think that's completely right. Uh, IPFS slash Filecoin did content first, storage second. And we did storage first, content second, or incentivization first and distribution second. And to us, I think that the storage layer is where all of the key constraints are. Um, and so it's, I think it's much better. And I think we did the, the right approach because that's where you're most constrained and that's where you have to make the most difficult decisions. Um, and so we built this super optimized storage layer, and now we can build an optimized delivery layer on top of that. Um, so to answer your question about the technologies, um, they're completely different. Uh, Skynet has this laser focus on performance, because uh, our goal is to replace the centralized web. And that's not going to happen unless the user experience is comparable or superior. And that means that we have to be able to deliver content to users as fast or faster than, say, an Akamai or a Netflix, who have these really elaborate uh, centralized constructions to get data to users quickly. And the problem with a DHT is that you have to talk to multiple servers, often bouncing around quite a bit in order to discover where a piece of content is and then download it. And that, that bouncing around takes a lot of time. So on Skynet and on SIA, Everything is point to point. When you get a file link, you immediately have a constant time way 
just a single hop way to go and fetch that file from a host. And so the the mm-hmm. reason that we're so different is because we have this heavy, heavy emphasis on performance and making sure that we can be superior to the centralized web. Right. So do you use the SIA blockchain? So I guess one of the reasons that IPFS has to do this like DHT thing is because they don't have a, you know, a centralized state in the form of a blockchain, but you guys do. Is, is that how you kind of get around it? Yeah. So the, uh, the key thing that the blockchain does for with SIA is it enforces that hosts have to hold on to the data. To get the speeds, we essentially just do a lot of lookup tricks. Um, and we also use like hinting so that the link that you receive has a couple of hints in it that say, you should try looking here. And oftentimes, you can get longer form links that just say outright, like this file is stored at these IP addresses, mm-hmm. which again, allows you to... So there's, we have more metadata associated with our files and how we do lookups, but that metadata allows us to be extremely fast. And so, but that metadata isn't stored on chain. No, it's not. In the time that everyone's been waiting for Filecoin to come out, they're, you know, instead what's popped up in its place now is a bunch of sort of centralized providers who sort of provide pinning services. So for example, I've used uh, Pinata before. And why does a this like Skynet vision need a marketplace inbuilt rather than just allowing sort of a marketplace to arise natu- on top of it sort of with providers? So I think that I I would say that I'm pretty unhappy with the pinning model of IPFS. If you want to be fully independent on IPFS, basically the only way to do that is to sell post. Um, And so uh, IPFS in some senses is like synonymous with self-hosting and in other senses is like you find a provider to host for you. And neither of those situations, well, so finding a provider like defeats the point of decentralization. Now you're dependent on them and you're straight back to the AWS model. Um, self-hosting is challenging because uh, it's difficult to keep servers up. You, you have all these costs associated with it, and, and it's just a headache. If you want to have any reliable amount of uptime, most everyday users like don't have the ability to get you know four nines of uptime on a self-hosted service. But we want you know the 15-year-old in his parents' house to be able to launch an application that has 100% uptime without having any reliance on like an S3. And so having this like built in, essentially SIA acts as a decentralized pinning service, allows you to put files on Skynet and then log off, shut off your computer and not worry about it and know that that file is getting, you know, as, as close as possible to 100% uptime with no work and, and no stress on your end as the creator or the distributor. Yeah, that was always one of my the issues that I took with IPFS is and you know, maybe this gets addressed in Filecoin and in and, and the layers on top, but was that this you know, you you have to actively pin your files to make them available in perpetuity. It's an active thing that one does in order to make their files available. And then if you want to have redundancy, if you want to have those files available in different places, well, you know, you need to do that as well. You know, I mean and again, maybe Filecoin takes on some of that um that burden. But in SIA, you know, you upload the files and well, the files get, you know, distributed automatically. They get, there's redundancy built in, correct? Yep. Correct. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I think I like, I really like that approach. So I've got like now like kind of a personal question about this because this is something that I would like to use myself. So I I have a self-hosted like cloud infrastructure, right? So like I have a computer in my house that is hosting my, my file services my email and you know I, that's my in-home cloud uh, system. Now, if I um, now in order to to back that up offsite, I do an offsite backup to um, to a computer that's somewhere else, similar setup. But I was thinking, you know, what I could do is just instead of doing that sync, you know, every day to that other computer, that other computer could just be a SIA or a Skynet. Host the entirety of that hard drive, you know, could be on the Skynet uh, network, and then instead of sending my files there from my cloud here, I just send it to the SIA network, right? And I'm backed up, I'm redundant, 
and I'm also contributing to the network from you know with that other computer that's was only meant for me, but is now like serving the common the common good. Is that like a sort of setup that one could could uh, use? Yeah, um, and as far as I understand your needs, um, I think that's something you could you could set up this weekend. That's the you know the Sci Network's at a point where it can do both of those things. All right. Well, there might be an, ex- an extra six terabytes of data on Sci this weekend. <laughs> I mean, what's interesting about this is you know I think that almost the, this product comes ten years too late because you know ten years ago, if you'll remember, you know you would buy a Mac. And then you would have that uh, backing up to um, you know your time machine, right? And then the best practice was to have you know two backups, like one local backup and one offsite backup. And what people do, well, they would set up other computers if if they had places to set those up, or they would pay for a service like Backblaze, for example, where they would effectively back up their uh, their time machine backup. So they would have three at all times, and. I think that now that people are just so used to cloud backups and, and even it's not even cloud backups, it's just, you know, cloud storage in the form of Google Drive or Dropbox where everything's like ubiquitously in the cloud, you know, going back to something like this here in terms of the, um, not in terms of like the decentralized aspect, but the user experience of like backing up your files is like kind of like going back to something that we had previously. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious what you think about like how people, like what's the likelihood that you know, people utilize this for their own cloud backup. Yeah. So the way we're approaching Skynet is really from the developer end. For example, you could build a decentralized Dropbox on top of Skynet that functions just like Dropbox, or you could build a decentralized Google Docs. And actually, you have a little bit more power than Google Docs does. So, so you might be able to build something even, you know, the next, the next thing that has an even better user experience and makes the cloud feel like the personal backup. So definitely at least our energy as a team is being focused on this forward direction and, and asking how can we take what users are used to and using Skynet's infrastructure, power that up to the next level rather than you know, it's for because we really want to see this stuff go mainstream. The, it's really important to us that the user experience is only better than what consumers are already used to. Um, and so, I think certainly uh, your backup use case is something we can support. But what we're most excited about is like just replacing Dropbox and Google Drive outright with something equivalent or superior mm-hmm. in in user experience that's just easy and just works. So. With this goal of replacing the internet, with the Skynet architecture, I can see how I would create a replacement Dropbox or a Google Doc or something replacement. Because what you're essentially doing is using Skynet as a storage backend, and then you're using code that is client side. But a lot of the internet is based on sort of a server side architecture. Let's say Sebastian wants to move, create an email, move his entire email inbox into this decentralized internet rather than on his own machine. Where would he run the sort of email server that, like, you know, running the um, SMTP server and all of that? Yeah, the SMTP server, or, yeah. So if you want integration with the traditional email system, that's not something we've looked into yet, as so I'm not sure exactly how the SMTP server would work. But like, what, so one thing that you can always do in Skynet is you can reach out to we call them curators, but it, essentially these like third party per app services that just sit there and run some sort of protocol. And so you could tell people like, hey, if you have a message to send me, send it to this third party or these like five third parties that have 100% uptime. But that would be for strangers. So for friends, it's actually pretty simple. I would just client side, right? If I want to send you an email, Sonny, and we're friends, I would just have a folder, you know, on my system that says Sonny, you know, messages for Sonny. And when you open up your email client, you're actually going to scrape my account or my files, essentially, you're going to look for that folder. And you're going to pull all the emails that I've written to you. Um, And so you're going to be able to see, you know, whether it's emails or texts or whatever, um, or whether it's like, an RSS feed, it's, it's content I've published and, and you're subscribed to receive that content. We can do that entirely client side. And then so you really only need these like curator services 
to connect mm-hmm. people who have never met before or who aren't friends. Um, and so these curator services exist as discovery. And without them, you know, it's, it's hard to find people through normal means. But even without them, you know, you can still talk to all your friends. You can find the friends of your friends and then you can get this like mm-hmm. nice big web and, and connect to everyone eventually. But this then does require sort of a massive re-architecting of how a lot of the web works. And, you know, I, I get this feeling that, you know, the web trends seem to be that we're moving towards more server side things, even things that aren't web, like, you know, even look at gaming, for example, like server side rendering for like, you know, gaming is becoming more and more popular. And so do you see a rev- that there will be a reversal of this trend? Or if not, so you've created Amazon S3. Now, where are we going to get the Amazon, I don't know, Lambda or something? Where's the compute layer? Yeah, so I think the the compute layer is, I'll call that unsolved for the moment, uh, just because uh, from a cryptographic perspective, it's it's difficult to get verifiable computation. And so it's it's difficult for me to send a job to an open marketplace of untrusted people and then trust that the results I get back was computed honestly. So for that, you really do want a trusted party, you know, like Amazon. But I think for the majority of applications that people use every day, possibly gaming aside, you don't actually need that much compute power. If you think about all the compute that goes into curating a YouTube-like application, that can entirely bottle down to uh, something a client-side computer can do. And so I do think that the advantages of Skynet will drive a lot more client-side thinking and client-side development. And then Another huge advantage to thinking about doing things client-side is infrastructure costs. If the user who's running your application is also the one doing the compute to keep the application alive, you're not running servers yourself. You're not paying for it yourself. And that's actually a point that we haven't touched on yet uh, for Skynet, which is that as a developer, when I put an application out onto Skynet and people start using it, if I have 10 million users tomorrow, my bandwidth bills are zero as the developer, my storage bills are zero because my, the users are the ones who are paying for all the infrastructure costs. Um, and so that means that I don't need to be a startup in order to compete. And this is especially powerful in video content. Uh, most YouTube competitors die because they don't get to a scale where they can monetize their users and pay for their bandwidth bills. Um, the bandwidth bills just crush them out of the gate. Skynet solves that problem for developers. It's, it's a, even though you have to rethink how you build applications, you don't lose much power and you gain the ability to not have to worry about infrastructure anymore. Yeah, this, this is something that, um, to touch on Sunny, what Sunny was saying about like decentralized compute power, I think that as much as I love this idea and I think it's really cool, I think one of the things that doesn't play in your favor here is the fact that in order to grow this network of nodes and to grow the the size of the storage on on the network in order to, you know, power this decentralized web, you know, you need a lot of individuals and infrastructure providers to rent their storage space in the system. If you want that to remain decentralized, if you want to be decentralized, you presumably you want to have like lots of individuals and like hobbyists putting their storage space on the on the network. But the reality is that increasingly people don't have storage space in their home anymore. Like, you know, how many people have a four terabyte hard drive in their house nowadays? Like virtually none. You know, it's a most people now rely on the cloud entirely. And in, embedded devices, well, are very it's very difficult to utilize the storage space there. So it'd be interesting to see like what kind of uh what will the constellation of storage providers look like? And do people sort of make businesses out of that, right? Like much like you have Bitcoin miners, will you have you know SIA service providers that are providing like storage to the network somehow? Yeah, this is something we've thought about a lot, and uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Where the where the end game is for this is like Bitcoin mining, you're going to have professionals and maybe even like LLCs that get set up to provide infrastructure to Skynet and to the SIA network. Um, and it's it's not going to be people at home. One advantage that data has over Bitcoin mining is that location and bandwidth and and hardware is not fungible. 
Um, and so like in Bitcoin mining, if you set up a data center in the middle of nowhere, Siberia, that mining power is still is still mining power and is still valuable. But on a storage network that emphasizes latency, someone in California is going to be serving different users than someone in the UK, than someone in Hong Kong. And so you have this natural decentralizing pressure just from the fact that people in different locations are going to want different data centers from each other. And so I think that that's probably what, what's going to allow SI to be decentralized, even in light of you know, economies of scale that happen when you start to make these bigger farms. Yeah, well, I'm probably going to spend some time this weekend fiddling with this, so uh, I, might, uh, I might reach out to you if I have any questions, if you don't mind. Awesome, yeah, feel um, free. And, uh, and yeah, I w- would love to like, also document some of that process of like, onboarding uh, Skynet for, for my, my own cloud backup. So let's let's move on to the trusted setup question then. So, you know, we, we've talked about trusted setups in the context of the show before. Uh, recently, we had like the the guys from Aztec on the podcast to talk about how they, you know, did the multi party computation to to set up the um, the Aztec um, zkp smart contract. I forget exactly what it's called. The Aztec engine, I think. So yeah, let's let's maybe dive into this. And you've given talks at a number of places. In describing your 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 distrust in trusted setups, uh, I think you've called them busted setups at some occasions. So, you know, what what is a trusted setup, and why do you think they're broken? Yeah. So, you know, I want to frame this conversation in the context of like I think people usually don't think about the threat model of trusted setups in the right way. And when I, when I hear people talking about like, oh, you know, X, Y, Z would have had to have happened in order for this trusted setup to be broken, that's just the wrong way to think about it. When, and when they think about, you know, what happens if this trusted setup gets broken? You know, what, what does society stand to lose? Uh, they just think about it in the wrong way. And so, so I think that we're going to try and take a very zoomed out approach in our analysis of trusted setup. But before we dive into it, like what, you know, what even is a trusted setup? So a trusted setup is a cryptographic construction that requires several collaborating people to, to build something. And if all of them are dishonest and acting in conspiracy, right, if they, if they all collude together, they can backdoor the system. And so uh, Zcash is my favorite example. I think it's, it's, it's super clean. Basically, Zcash has a trusted setup where a bunch of people work together to build this secret or the, this like object that we have to use in our proofs. And if all of those people who work together collude and they all told each other, you know, their part of the puzzle, then that group, as a group, can print money. And so they can print an unlimited amount of money in Zcash and no one would ever know except maybe seeing that there are too many coins flying around. So the idea with a trusted setup is that, you know, and, and I think the original Zcash ceremony had five or six participants. So it's like these, these five people. Six, yeah. Six. So these six people will work together to build this object. And as long as at least one of the six people destroys their piece of the puzzle, then the whole trusted setup is safe. Um, and no, you know, nobody can steal anything. But if if all six people collude, they retain their piece of the puzzle. They share it with each other and build this uh, essentially this back door. Then they can print for themselves as much money as they want. If you put it in other terms, the participants in the trusted setup, and correct me if I'm I'm wrong here, they're generating collectively generating a private key, and then destroying that private key. And what's left is a public key that goes into the setup of the zero knowledge circuit or whatever construction, right? Like what's left is basically a public key for which there is no private key. And if everybody colludes and had that private key, then in, then in that instance, they could backdoor the system. Yeah, I think that's a good way to think about it. Okay. And so when you talked about, you know, the threat model and people looking at it the wrong way, and, you know, just for, in all fairness, like since that Zcash trusted setup there's basically been like a new setup now where you know many more people are involved and we, we can get into that um, but you know what is the framework through which people view the type of trusted setup that like traditionally has been done and why are there assumptions about the 
the threat model wrong? Yeah. So I think I want to start by focusing on actually what's at stake. Um, Because I think people often underestimate what's at stake. So what when you do a trusted setup, what you're building is a cryptographic primitive. It's like a, a building block to build a greater system. And the goal of all of these systems, right, at least in cryptocurrency, like what what we want as an industry is mainstream adoption, right? We want a billion people or even five billion people using these systems that are that are built out of the building blocks we're making today. And so when we make something like a trusted setup, if that gets accepted, if that particular trusted setup gets accepted into, say, like the cryptocurrency canon, and then cryptocurrency goes mainstream, you could have systems that depend on this building block in very surprising ways. Because, you know, things will use each other, and then you get Zcash, and then things start to depend on Zcash, and they assume Zcash is private, and they build other stuff. And as you continue you know, making making the system the ecosystem more complex and elaborate, and as as things keep building on top of each other, you could end up in a situation where a single broken trusted setup in the whole ecosystem could have this like massive systemic cascade of vulnerabilities. And an attacker isn't just defeating Zcash; they're defeating you know oracles, and they're defeating you know who who knows. People use building blocks in surprising ways, and so. Like the first thing I want to hone in on is really like these cryptographic primitives that we build are likely to be used in elaborate ways that kind of go beyond how we understand them today. And, and 10 or 15 years down the line, if we accept a primitive today, we might find that that, that primitive is a key building block in like you know nearly every major application that's used mainstream. And so I frame this from the perspective of like, you know, what do we have to lose? Potentially, a broken cryptographic primitive could wipe out the whole ecosystem. Uh, and for example, like if, if um, quantum computers came in and broke ECDSA, yeah, that would, that would wipe out the whole ecosystem. And so we, as an ecosystem, we want to be really careful with the cryptographic primitives that we collectively decide to trust and decide to build things on top of, because um, that's going to cascade very poorly if, if it ends up being broken. And from the perspective of an attacker, the risk reward, the the reward is extremely high. So if you do manage to break a trusted setup, you could potentially print yourself a trillion dollars, you know, or, or you could manipulate the ecosystem to earn a trillion dollars, right? So I, th- I think that, the you know, one of the first places people miss the mark is just in how important these primitives are. I mean, so if, if we come back to this idea, this idea that essentially what you're doing is you're creating a pri- a public key for which you're trying to prove that there is no private key. Yep. I don't know how conceivable this is, but couldn't we construct protocols around which we agree that some random number is generated by like random occurrences and that that random number would be the public key and effectively where we just like construct a, a random number? Like, I mean, we, that's what we're looking for. Like we're, we're looking for a random number essentially. Yeah, so I believe it depends on the protocol. Um, and a lot of protocols that come out that defeat trusted setup, like like that, you know, when when a cryptographer finds a way to change a protocol into no longer needing a trusted setup, it's because they found a completely trustable way to create a random number. And so that is that is a technique that gets used. But in mm. the in the cases where we still have trusted setup, it's because the only way that we could think of to get this object, this public key, which I think is kind of a, a you know, at the, at the very lowest layer, ends up being a, a weak abstraction or a leaky abstraction. You have this complex object that you have to build that has to have certain properties. And in a lot of these protocols, the only way that we know to give it the properties that, it, that we require is to allow or allow a set of colluding individuals to make a private key. Yeah, here's an example that I just came up with off the top of my head. Imagine what we wanted to do was come up with a random number that was the product of six primes. We can't just guess random numbers because, you know, we'd basically never ever get to six primes. But if we, you know, had six people each choose a prime and then we did some MPC to multiply them all together 
And then we end up with a number that's six primes, but we don't want it to be that anyone can figure out what the six underlying primes were. That, that, that's just an example of why it's not as simple as just creating any old random number. It, it's usually some sort of random number with specific properties. Oh, okay. See, that's where my understanding of this falls apart. See, I thought it was just generating some random number. But it's a random number that also needs to have some predefined properties. Yeah, some some algebraic structure that we then exploit to construct proofs of zero-knowledge proofs, essentially. So one of the things you talked about in your talk was that we should be looking at trusted setups from a more macroscopic view in the sense of not thinking about how to break any one specific trusted setup, but rather getting... Let's say there's a thousand trusted setups and the goal is to get one broken trusted setup accepted by the community. So could you explain, yeah, could you explain some of your thinking on this? Yeah, so this this ties right back into uh, kind of how it opened up is, is thinking in terms of what's at stake. If as a community, we adopt a culture of accepting trusted setups um, and so we end up with multiple, you know, cryptographic primitives that are trusted setups, in our ecosystem, in our, in our set of building blocks that we build the ecosystem out of, you only need one of them to be busted in order for the whole ecosystem to experience these trillion dollar, you know, I'll, I'll just call it like the, the trillion dollar vulnerability. Someone can insert a trillion dollar backdoor, not by breaking every trusted setup, but they, they only have to create a single trusted setup that's broken that the community accepts as secure. And this, this comes down to a social problem as much as it is uh, a technical problem. The question is not, you know, is, is everything secure? The question is, how do I convince the community that something which is not secure is in fact secure? And so the more as a community we embrace trusted setup and the more it becomes normalized, for a new team to come up with a trusted setup protocol and, and launch, you know, launch a new system that depends on this new trusted setup, the easier it will be for someone to slip something through the cracks. And so that's really the key reason that I take the stance, no trusted setup should be tolerated ever. Because as soon as you start to draw the line, like, well, maybe X, X is okay, and maybe Y is okay, You've given breathing room for an attacker to use social techniques and politicking and social manipulation to move that bar. Like, well, what if we just move the bar a little bit left? And then they know that if they just need like two centimeters to the left, then they can slip in a broken trusted setup. And so I think the only way to protect against this kind of social engineering is to just completely shut it down um, and, and make it so that the trusted setup is, is just outright not acceptable within the broader community because otherwise I do think you'll end up you'll end up with attackers who have enough wiggle room to try and insert a trillion dollar backdoor and of course if we're talking about a trillion dollar backdoor your your attackers are going to be the NSA uh, your attackers are going to be you know the Russian secret service and and the Chinese secret service and and you're going to have well funded you know groups with 10 20 50 year time horizons who are just spending all day, every day, with a bunch of PhDs asking the question, how do we convince the world that our broken thing is actually not broken? What resonates here is, the, is a similar problem that we have with the, you know, the root CA system, where the trust in the root CA system is only like the trust that you have in the most malicious actor, like not the root CA, but like the delegated CAs that can issue certificates at will, you know, and like there are hundreds of these. And so... Similarly here, uh, you are putting your trust in the least trustworthy trusted setup. That's right. And uh, similar to the CA system, you don't know which one is the least trustworthy, right? And so you have 100 of these things, and you don't know how much attention has gone into all 100, or you have a thousand, or you know, however many, yeah. and you don't know which one is, needs the most scrutiny. So it's kind of like, you know, you don't have an issue with the Zcash trusted setup, but you have an issue with the fact that, okay, first there was a Zcash one, then there was like a Aztec one. Now Loopring did a trusted setup. And as we get more and more trusted setups, the chance that one of them is broken just increases. And it's sort of like a slippery slope there. 
isn't this sort of analogous to the slippery slope of, let's say, blockchains as a whole, right? You know, we convinced people to take their money and put it on these like crazy decentralized systems. And okay, Bitcoin, first one, great. Then we had like, you know, we had more chains, like we had Saya come up and then you know, maybe we had something like Ethereum, which is, you know, maybe, you know, Ethereum's initial setup was a little bit less trustless than Bitcoin's was. Isn't that also just sort of a, you could say like, you know, the unknown properties of a trusted setup are pretty similar to the unknown properties of a code base. Cause like, you know, 99.99% of users don't audit code bases when they use them. So what, what, what makes this different? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's one super important key difference. Uh, which is that with something like, uh, let's say, Ethereum, your confidence in the system can grow over time. And so even if it's initially not very well audited, you know, as Ethereum grows from $100 million system to a billion dollar system to a trillion dollar system, it gets increasing scrutiny. Problems get identified and fixed. Or you know, if, if the problems can't be fixed, Ethereum can be abandoned. And so like, essentially, as Ethereum scales, scrutiny scales and we can identify and fix things or, or you know we can identify that there's a problem and that's super important in a trusted mm-hmm. setup you never have the ability to improve confidence um, and in fact as the thing grows confidence actually decreases over time because you know the aztec protocol the aztec trusted setup is one thing today it happened recently we can go and interview the people if Aztec is the thing, you know, if Aztec's trusted setup becomes a building block that has 5 billion users on it, thinking of it from the perspective of like, you know, a, an enterprise in South Africa that's jumping on and using the Aztec protocol, it's like, who are these guys that, you know, they, this ritual thing happened six years ago and it's like some weird crypto and, and weren't they like all anarchists and kind of crazy anyway? Mm-hmm. And so trusted setup only loses confidence over time, whereas blockchains and code bases, those things are all auditable and they gain confidence over time. And so I think that is a, a super key difference. And you know, I wouldn't want a trillion dollars on Ethereum today. I would want Ethereum to go through much more scrutiny before it gets to a trillion dollars. But it's possible to put it through that scrutiny. With a trusted setup, it's not possible to add more scrutiny to the trusted setup. Once once you have the object, the damage is done and it's hidden. What about sort of open trusted setups and also more general purpose trusted setups? So these were two goals of the sapling trusted setup. So when Zcash switched from Sprout to sapling, sapling sort of had two parts to it. The first part was to create some generic trusted setup thing. And then that was used as an input to part two, which was used to create the Zcash specific circuit. But the point of it was that the result of the first part, if anyone else wants to create their own trusted setup for their own application, they could reuse that first part. And they made that first part extremely open. Like they had, I don't actually remember the numbers, but I know I participated in it. And why don't we just like dedicate a lot of energy to creating one sort of master, super open trusted setup with tens of thousands of people participating, and then just use that as the basis for everything. Yeah, so we really have to go back to our malice hat, which is like, let's say I'm NIST, um, and I get a, you know, a national security letter from the NSA. And I'm tasked with creating a broken trusted setup that is the one true trusted setup, you know, the, the one trusted setup that everyone uses. First of all, because I'm NIST, I have a lot more swing than Zcash. And then second of all, I'm going to be asking all of these social questions like, how can I make it look like 10,000 people participated when in fact they didn't? You know, are there things that I can do to make Sonny believe that he participated in the trusted setup when in fact he was using you know, code that was that was just streaming the results of his participation to our servers. Um, and, and is he going to catch that? What, you know, what underhanded techniques do I have available? And I think the upper bound on the amount of creativity that you can have for an attack like this 
is extremely high. The, the number of underhanded strategies that you can use to create something that looks and feels secure, but in fact isn't, I think is is super high. And so even these you know, like kind of universal setup ideas I really don't like because I feel like, you know, if we try, if we try and say, okay, we'll, we'll get to one, you know, one universal setup, you'll have bad actors like the Chinese government and the US government and the Russian government saying like, okay, but, but the universal setup will be ours, not whatever this crazy crypto community came up with. And again, this is, this is a social game. It's a political battle of, how do we move the minds of the mainstream to accept, you know, which single trusted setup do the minds of the mainstream gravitate towards? And again, I, I think that's a battle that we don't want to wage. And that even that battle all by itself is too risky and that we have to fall back to just no trusted setup. We, we just shouldn't have trusted setup. So what's the alternative? Uh, I mean, we talked briefly at the beginning of the show about Sonics. What's the alternative to trusted setups? What are these? you know, rolling trusted setups or continuous setups? And how are the security assumptions different here than for a trusted setup? I think my favorite solution to this is just to treat all trusted setups as broken and throw them away and, and not use them and look for other things. And so when someone invents trusted setup, you know, a trusted setup ritual or a trusted setup technique, it's interesting insofar as it teaches us new math and new cryptography and gives us maybe ideas and tools that may eventually lead to a non-trusted setup. And for example, Snarks, which are all trusted setup at the moment, have a competitor called Starks, which has no trusted setup. And so that's very exciting to me because now a lot of these applications, which, you know, if you take a very sharp no trusted setup ever line, these have, you know, you lose the ability to do a Zcash Starks are a mathematical innovation that bring back the ability to do Zcash in the absence of a trusted setup. And so, you know, I think I think my favorite way to go here is to treat all trusted setup systems as you know, kind of academic value. It, it's not that it's not that they're like wastes of time and wastes of space. It's just they're not something you can use in production. They're a, an intellectual stepping stone. To something better. To answer your question about Sonic, that one was one I struggled with because it's it almost sounds good enough. It's very close to good enough. And the problem with Sonic is that once you or what what I'll say is these rolling trusted setups. So just to give uh, the listeners a definition, a rolling trusted setup means that any time a new person can join the ritual and add, you know, their secret to the object. And then as long as you're secure, as long as you do it safely, you know that nobody else can break the system anymore. And so you could have this thing where, you know, as, as we grow and as we scale our trusted setup from a thousand users to a million users to a billion users, and that company in, in South Africa is thinking about joining this primitive, that company in Africa could just participate in the trusted setup. And now, now it doesn't matter that it started from this, you know, random crazy crypto group. It's like, well, well, we participated in it ourselves. We trust it because we know we did it right. And so that's very compelling, except for one caveat, which is that every proof that was generated early on is suspect and can't be trusted. And so every time you evolve the trusted setup, you still have proofs floating around that are suspect. And also, I just go back to like, how clever would you know 25 PhDs thinking about ways to social engineer a broken Sonic into the world? How clever would they get? And I don't know because I don't have that brain power. And so that makes me wary. It's like, this feels like something where I could be outsmarted. Um, and so even with Sonic, that puts me at my limit. I can't come up with a plausible story that makes me feel happy that I, you know, I could, with enough resources, break Sonic. I'm not confident that a bunch of people working together who are way smarter than I am couldn't come up with a way to break it. And so even with things like Sonic, I default to saying we just, we just can't do trusted setup because I don't feel like we've proven that the attack surface is small enough that someone like the NSA couldn't hit it. So what's the way forward then? If we are to leverage Zcash, another zero-knowledge proof, cryptocurrencies and and things like Aztec and the ability to transact anonymously and even perhaps you know do computations anonymously 
I mean, it, it, it all comes down to trust, right? Like you, you have to trust that someone or something built this primitive. So what, what is the solution in your view? Yeah, so I think that zero knowledge systems um, and just cryptography in general has made an enormous amount of practical progress in the past two years. Just, just as an example, in 2014, 2015, I was kind of making this decision as a, as a technologist do I focus my energy on cryptography um, or do I focus my energy on game theory? And, and I chose to go the, you know, the game theory mechanism design, like incentivization route, because that felt like there was more innovation available. But cryptography has surprised me immensely with all the crazy creative things that have come up. Starks are relatively recent and there are more papers coming out that are starting to suggest that Starks are not even close to as good as we can do and that we can do much better with no trusted setup. And so I think that uh, really, I think we just have to wait a little bit. And, and cryptography, especially in 2019, showed that there is so much room for improvement and so many exciting new like mathematical ideas being created um, that I think that we will have the answer to how do you make a good Zcash? How do you make a good Aztec? How do you make a good VDF? You know, how, how do you get random numbers without trusted setup? And I think that, you know, three, five years from now, we'll have great answers to all of those questions and, the, and that we won't need trusted setup um, and that we can do everything that we want to do today, five years from now, using much safer cryptography. Cool. So to wrap up, I, I have two questions. One is, do you use like Zcash or anything like that? Yeah, I was gonna say I uh, I don't. I'm I'm actually pretty strict about what protocols I engage in, or like if I do use yeah. something like say Zcash or Ethereum, uh, I try to minimize my exposure to a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. and so I'm you know I get the currency and then I trade it out as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So yeah, generally no. What, I'm curious, why is that? Yeah, I I think that the systemic risk of most of these platforms is just grossly underestimated. So like. Recently, DeFi has had a lot of black swans. Um, in my opinion, they're not black swans at all. They're, it's something we can expect to happen quite frequently mm -hmm. just because th these protocols have not been designed to be as robust as everyone thinks they are. And so I want to minimize my exposure to being on a platform that has all of its money drained suddenly and unexpectedly because I, th I think a lot of these things that are out there today are eventually going to get you know, taken for, for the entire you know, market cap of, of the thing. And then, so to wrap up, to bring it all back, is there anywhere in the Skynet or SIA architecture where you anticipate using zero knowledge proofs eventually? I mean, so the dream would be to get SIAs to be fully anonymous, which is a little bit out of reach right now. But like, if you, you know, you can imagine leveraging the hosts to set up uh, onion routing circuits. We have a bunch of techniques we've generated uh, that we've come up with in-house uh, that would allow us to you know, emulate Tor with hopefully better privacy and massively better latency, you know, close to centralized web latencies with privacy that's superior to Tor. But then the coin situation still ends up being a problem because if you're paying people and you're using traceable money, uh, that's not anonymous. And so Definitely on the SIA platform, like we would like to get to a point where the whole thing is anonymous. And I think, you know, that's, that's probably not going to happen in the next three to five years. We, we're waiting for more cryptography to come out, more techniques to come out. Um, and, and also just for, for the platform in general to be more mature. But yeah, we do, we do hope to use a lot of this stuff in the future, I, I, especially Starks and related technologies I'm very excited about. And I hope that we get to employ them at some point. Cool. Thanks a lot, David. And thanks for coming back on and, um, and sharing these updates about Skynet and, uh, and also sharing your thoughts about trusted setups. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's always great to, uh, to be with you guys. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It 
helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.